Hey, Bio 430, here's your lecture on muscles, and um, we're going to start with muscles of the upper limb. And before I get into muscle by muscle, uh, generally, here are the things students should be thinking about when you study muscles in an anatomy class. We already learned about muscles, their physiology, studying the neuromuscular junction and the sarcomere, and um, we did the EMG lab. Now, in the anatomy of muscles, there's so many. Um, you have to have an organized way of how to study them. And here's what you're responsible for, for muscles that we talked about. Call these the, the golden rules of, of muscles. <coughs> the attachments, the O's and the I's. Muscles usually attach somewhere on the skeleton. Sometimes they attach to other things like connective tissues or skin, but most of the time it's um, an attachment to the skeleton. The reason why you do that is muscles cross joints, and when they contract, they move joints. So attachments to the skeleton Muscles cross joints to move the joint. Exclamation point, move them. We call that, um, the, I'm kind of skipping ahead, the, the muscle action. So let me get to that later. So when the muscle contracts, moves the joint, we call that the muscle's action or its function. I usually use the term action. Um, so that's if the muscle crosses a joint. If we're talking about the upper limb. Think about the shoulder joint. Think about how the scapula moves, okay? Think about the elbow, flexion, extension, pronation, supination. Think about the wrist and think about your fingers. Once again, the scapula, shoulder, okay, elbow, wrist, fingers. Those are the joints we're concerned about. Sometimes a muscle can cross one joint, sometimes it can cross two joints, okay, or even more than two joints. So you have to think about all the joints the muscle is crossing and how it moves those joints, okay? If a muscle attaches to something else that's not skeleton, say a connective tissue or skin, it'll usually um, tense the skin, okay? Um, there's one of those we're doing today, I'll talk about it later. Um, so what's the um, O's and I's, the origins and the insertions? The origin is the muscle attachment to the bone that basically is mostly not moving. Origin, O. <clears throat> the attachment to the bone that doesn't move for the most part. Attachment to bone that doesn't move. So the insertion is the attachment to the bone that's moving. Insertion, I. Attachment to bone. So we'll, we'll go through that. Muscles have attachments. They're called origins, insertions. All books map it out that way. We'll do the same thing. Innervation, next term.
basically muscles are innervated by nerves and we have to know which ones. I'll focus on the nerves in another separate lecture. Um, let's see. Muscles are innervated, that's the correct term, innervated by nerves. Okay, and these nerves, of course, they exist outside the brain and spinal cord, so they're part of the PNS, the peripheral nervous system. And we'll go through them in another lecture. If you rip a nerve out of a muscle, you can't contract it. It's denervated, it, it's paralyzed. So that's important. Okay, that's innervation. Uh, more on action, how muscles move joints. There's, there's a particular thing, a particular way you have to describe, name the action. You have to describe the movement and describe the joint or region that's moving. So we're naming muscle actions. Um, Get the movement. Like, for example, flexion extension. Uh, from the anatomical position, we talked about these before. Flexion is moving, say, your arm forward. So think about the joint that's moving my shoulder. And if I bring it forward, that's flexion. If I bring it back, that's extension. So the movement is, say, for example, flexion, and um, the joint that's moving is the shoulder. Or I could say the region that's moving, the arm. So you could say flexion at shoulder, or you could say um, flex arm. It's a different way of saying the same thing. So name the movement, okay, and, and name the joint or region that's moving. So I've just underlined, you know, uh, things like for example, I just can't say what's the action flex flex what <laughs> okay you, you have to kind of say the joint or the region so that's how you name an action moving on understand um, the next rule The next three rules kind of go together, so let me just kind of present them all at once. When the muscles, when muscle contracts, they pull, they never push. That's the first thing. They're pulling on the joints, moving things. So imagine my, my elbow is extended and there's a muscle that crosses it. When this muscle on the front, when it pulls, it pulls, it flexes the joint. Flexion is either bringing your arm forward or it's closing a joint angle. Extension is opening the joint angle or bringing it back to the anatomical position. And that's the other thing. Remember your anatomical position. I don't think you can see my feet. But everything is, is relative to the anatomical position. Okay. So all the movements are described relative to this position. I'm going to be your model today demonstrating action. So I'll always start from the anatomical position. They pull. They never push. Muscles cross joints, I talked about that. The actions of muscles can be figured out where the muscle inserts. Conversely, you can tell where a muscle inserts by its action. And this last golden rule is really important because in, in your head, as you got the book open, you're sitting at your desk, you have to think about these things so it makes intuitive sense. And that really helps. So that way it's not brute force memorization, okay? It just you understand the concept of why this action is what it is for this muscle. For example, um, the first part: the actions of muscles can be figured out where the muscle inserts. Hmm. 
But let's give an example of that. So you got scapula. I'm gonna draw a better scapula. So there's my joint. Let's say that's a shoulder joint. And okay, well, let's say you have a muscle. Um, let's say I tell you you got a muscle crosses the joint and inserts right around there. So there's my muscle. There's its insertion. Uh, I for insertion. Hmm, okay, so that's where it inserts. So, can't you figure out what it does? If it inserts on the lateral aspect, on the outside, can't you envision in your mind when this muscle pulls, it's gonna swing the arm out that way? Okay, and uh, what do we call that? If you swing the arm out this way because you're pulling from the outside. That's abduction of the arm, movement in the frontal or coronal plane. Okay, so that's kind of what I mean. If a muscle inserts on the outside of the arm, it's gonna probably be an abductor, right? And conversely, um, you can tell a muscle inserts by its action. For example, um, let's do that again. Hmm. I'll tell you that this muscle, it adducts the arm, adduction. You start abducted and this muscle can bring it back. Hmm, okay, let's see. Well, if that's its action, it must pull from the inside, the medial aspect, not the outside. You can't bring the arm in if you attach to the outside. So you have to attach to the inside to pull the arm in. For example, in my little picture here, So we have a muscle, it's an adductor, it must pull from the inside, it goes from there to there to pull the arm back that way. So there's the insertion right there, put a little eye for insertion, okay? Um, so th that's the basic idea. Let's start to go through some muscles, but here's a picture of the different movements of joints in a figure. And you can kind of look at it, study the different movements. As I go through muscle by muscle, I'll tell you the action and I'll demonstrate them for you. We're gonna do muscles that move or stabilize the scapula. Um, so you, there's different ways you can move the scapula and I list them here. Laterally rotate, medially rotate the scapula. I mean, it's hard to visualize, but <clears throat> As I move my arms out to here, if I move them all the way up over my head, the scapula have to laterally rotate out. So imagine the inferior angle of the scapula rotating out. So that way it, it, it accommodates my arm going all the way up over my head. So. So when you completely abduct the arm, right, that's the shoulder joint. It's usually accompanied with lateral rotation of the inferior angle. That's usually how it's stated in the book. Remember the inferior angle, that bottom angle? It just kind of laterally rotates out.
and there's different ways you, you could say that. Sometimes books say not lateral rotation of the inferior angle, they say superior rotation of the glenoid. And there, there's different ways you can say it. That's usually how I, how, how I say it. So medial rotation of the scapula is if your arm is fully abducted and the inferior angle has laterally rotated out, when you put your arm back, it'll medially rotate back in. Okay. Elevation and depression of scapula. That one's easier. The scapula can just slide up, just like when you shoulder shrug, or then you put them back down, or if, or if you're holding like a heavy bar, and it's like depressing your scapula. Like, so your scapula can move down and up, down and up. That's elevation, depression. Protraction, retraction. Protraction is um, like if I extend my arm, kind of like a robot, but if I want to fully extend my arm like that, that's protraction, like when you push against a wall. So protraction is moving the scapula forward. Retraction is throwing your shoulders back, like standing at military attention. So protraction as in pushing, uh, re retract you know, as in standing at attention. So all these muscles we're talking about, if you're going to move the scapula, they have to attach to the scapula. So I hope you've been studying your, your bones. Um, we're going to talk about surface features of the scapula. These muscles usually go from trunk to scapula as a general rule. Trunk to scapula. So usually, wherever it inserts on the scapula will be the insertion and wherever it attaches to the trunk, the origin, um, or, or something like that. And so I think, well, what, what's, what's the trunk? Well, usually ribs, so, you know, we'll, we'll go through them. Let, let's start to do that. We'll start with traps and rhomboids. Muscles of the back, traps, rhomboids. Um, and as we go through the muscles, I'll kind of tell you why the muscle is named, why it's named, and these pictures here, now the trapezius is all by itself on the skeleton. In this picture, um, kind of half of it, you can kind of see all the other muscles of the back with the trapezius. You should be able to identify the muscle either way, either by itself or um, in a dissected cadaver with all the other muscles. Okay, so trapezius is named, um, kind of shaped like a trapezoid, if you can see that. So it's named for its shape. All muscles are named for different reasons. This one named trapezius and rhomboids, named for their shape, like a, like a trapezoid or a rhombus, which looks like, like a four-sided uh, four shape. Okay, so trapezius. Be able to identify it, be able to name it. That's, of course, just saying, hey, that's the trapezius. No, it's attachments. And um, the general rule is the origins, um, they use the color red, and the insertions, they use the color blue. So I'll use red and blue on my slide. I'll stick to basic black on the white on the whiteboard. Um, all right, let's see here. So the origin, occipital bone, spinous processes of C1 to C12. So I just put an O next to all this right there. So all this from there to there, all the way down there, it's, it's a big long muscle right in the middle, okay? So it's going from the trunk, and all these muscle fibers, they converge to the scapula on the shoulder right there, okay? So O's, the attachment. Occipital bone, spinous processes, C1 to T12.
So that's its trunk attachment. And all the muscles, they converge to right here. And it's hard to see there, so I put this picture in, and I kind of like shaded in blue where it's attaching here. Uh, three parts for the insertion. Lateral clavicle, acromion, scapular spine, just like it says there. Lateral clavicle, acromion, scapular spine. Even though it's right there on the slide for you, it, it does help just to kind of write it, to solidify it in your memory. And of course, your, your book, um, you can use your book during, and your notes during your exam. Um, but, but still, just the process of learning, it still helps to write things down. So again, lateral clavicle, acromion, scapular spine. That's kind of what we're going with here. And if you compare how I word the attachments to books, books tend to be a little more fancy and nuanced in how they stated. They use more precise language. I, I try to simplify and be a little bit more on the simple end. This is actually less complicated than you might read in your book. So this is kind of the level of detail I'll, I'll hold you accountable for on your exam. So those are the attachments. Um, so let's look at that muscle again. So this is such a big muscle. We, we teach it as having three parts. Um, and they all do different things. In green, so these are the trapezius actions. I say the descending fibers elevate scapula. Descending because um, they start from here and they go down to the scapula. So when they pull up, they elevate the scapula like that. The transverse part, the fibers run completely horizontal in the transverse plane. They retract the scapula. So again, that's like standing at military attention, retract. The ascending fibers, they start from down here and they go up to the scapular spine and they can kind of kind of pull down a little bit. So pull down, uh, that's depressed scapula. Um, I want to add one more thing to this note here. The descending part, when it pulls up, it again, these angles of the inferior angles of the scapula, they kind of rotate out, like I said before, when you fully abduct the arm. The trapezius, the, the descending fibers, are partly responsible for when they elevate the scapula, it's also accompanied with a little bit of lateral rotation of the inferior angle. So I'm going to add that. I want you to know that to this part. So it also laterally rotates. Sometimes I'll say abducts. Laterally rotate or abducts the inferior angle. I'm really emphasizing that today because I think doing this, extending your arm, abducting your arm all the way up, is really important so like you can reach that top shelf. So I'll just, I just squeeze that in. It's kind of like busy on the whiteboard here, but um, yeah, so those two things for the descending part.
Moving on to rhomboids, um, I made this slide to show you that when dissecting a cadaver, you would see that rhomboids are deep to the trapezius. So I always try to do side by sides so you can kind of get a better sense because we're not doing cadaver dissection. But this is more superficial, uh, deeper, and then this is the rhomboids by itself. This muscle is called the levator scapula, but we're not doing it, so don't worry about this muscle. The one I have outlined in green, rhomboids. Again, named for its shape. Shaped like a rhombus. A four-sided uh, shape, quadrilateral. I'm just writing right, rhomboids are deep to trapezius. Those and the eyes are on the next slide. Again, going from trunk to scapula. Here, are the origins are the spinous processes. C6 to T4. And you, you can kind of notice on this picture and on the previous slide, there's actually two rhomboid muscles here. There's a minor and a major. Minors are superior, that's usually the rule, but I've noticed in cadavers, it's hard to distinguish the major from the minor, so I usually just teach it as one muscle, rhomboids. You're not responsible for major and minor, just so you know. So the attachments starting from the minor all the way down here to the major, spinous processes of C6 to T4, they kind of reach down a little bit and they're going to insert, where I got this blue line, medial border of scapula, that's the insertion. And now that I told you the insertion, can you figure out how it's going to move the scapula? Okay, it's, it's up here to that it's going to kind of pull it this way. So that we call that retraction of the scapula. Okay, got it right there. So basically, uh, I usually say retract scapula. Sometimes folks say adduct scapula. Because like when you move it closer to the midline, that's the same thing as saying adduction, a deduction. You can say that too. It's a different way of saying the same thing. I'm going to move on. Next two muscles. Pec minor, serratus anterior. I say pec minor as a shortcut, but as a student, you're learning it, you use the full name, pectoralis minor. There's also pectoralis major that we're doing later on. Remember, we're doing first muscles that move or stabilize the scapula. The pec major attaches to the arm, not the scapula. Again, here's my superficial deep picture side by side. Here's pec major. The big chest muscle, the pecs, the ones you like to show up on the beach if you're a well-developed man. Um, remove that muscle, pec minor. So again, the minor is deep to the major, basically. Pectoralis minor, deep to pec major. So this muscle is named for its region. The pectoral region is basically the chest. And minor is a relative term. Major, right? So if there's a minor, there's a major somewhere. Sometimes you learn both, sometimes you don't. We'll do both of these muscles today. So the pectoralis minor. Um, here I have a highlighted in green, just so you know what I'm talking about. It goes from here to here. Those are the attachments, the O's and the I's on the next slide. The, um, let's see here. So I got the, um, oh, hold on a second. We'll try and mix something up here. Allow me to pause.
I had mixed those up. Now I got it straight. The origin, ribs three to five. The insertion, core cord process. Again, origin to insertion. Um, I had it reversed. You know, sometimes you can reverse it. Sometimes this can be the O, that can be the I, okay? But this is usually how it's taught. The ribs are the O, it inserts on the scapula, that's the I. That's what we're going with. Ribs three to five, and those muscles converge up, pulls on the coracoid process. Of the scapula, okay, you remember that process, we call it the bird's beak in that lecture. So when it contracts, it kind of pulls down on the scapula. It can also pull the scapula forward a little bit because this is in the front. It's reaching back to attach the scapula so it can pull it forward a little bit. So that's why its actions are depressed, protract scapula. Depress, protract scapula. Okay, so what happens if it's reversed? What if, like I had it, what if that's the origin and that's the insertion? It can help move ribs, elevate ribs. Um, any muscle that has an attachment to the ribs is called an accessory muscle of breathing or of inspiration. And so, um, because these muscles attach to ribs, they can do that, okay? But we're gonna stick with this one for your exam. The insertion is the coracoid process. There's a blank picture you could study there. I want to move on um, to the next muscle. Here's the serratus anterior. It's the only muscle there. So if I say identify muscle and this is all you see, these aren't different muscles. These little, they call them fleshy slips. This is all one muscle, the serratus. Named for its appearance, like uh, the serrations of a knife blade, it has a serrated appearance. Serrated anterior. Anterior is a relative term. There's a serratus posterior. Um, well, there's a couple of those, but we're not, we're not doing those. We're just doing the serratus anterior, not the serratus posterior. Let's talk about its attachments. You can kind of get a sense of what it's doing here. So let's look at the O's and the I's. It originates ribs one to nine. Sometimes books say one to eight, um, either or. If I say one to eight, one to nine, shouldn't really matter. It's a lot of ribs. And all of those, again, fleshy slips. Let me write that down, I keep saying that. Kind of a weird term I read in one of the books I came up with. Um, fleshy slips, all these in individual attachments that give it a serrated, a, <clears throat> a serrated appearance. They all converge back. They're going underneath the scapula and they're inserting on the medial border of it. The medial border, not the lateral border, the medial border. So imagine. These are more or less anterior, and they're going posterior and grabbing the inside of the medial border. They're going to pull the scapula forward. Okay, just imagine it pulling it forward this way. So when the whole muscle contracts, that is protract scapula. Like I said before, as in pushing. Okay, if I push like that, but I extend that way, a little bit more of extension is you're protracting the scapula and you're using that muscle. 
as in pushing. Sometimes they call serratus anterior the boxer's muscle because when you go for the knockout punch, you know, you extend all the way forward. Serratus anterior. Um, okay. But also, sometimes you can just use, for example, the inferior part. If just the inferior part contracts, imagine just pulling this inferior angle. So along with trapezius, this inferior part of serratus also rotates that um, inferior angle laterally when you fully reach up like that. So let me write that whole thing here. Let me raise the board. Along with the descending part of trapezius, part of serratus anterior um, laterally rotates the inferior angle of scapula. Inferior part of serratus anterior Inferior angle of scapula. So the muscles, the descending part of trapezius, inferior part of serratus, and that's the angle. The action laterally rotates that inferior angle. There's the muscle by itself. There's only muscle, one muscle shown. So if I say identify muscle, I don't even have to point to it. It's the only one shown. Serratus anterior. All right, questions for you. I'll give you a moment to think about that. All right. <clears throat> Name three parts of trapezius and the action each part does. You had the descending fibers, the top part, which could elevate the scapula, and also with that, helping a little bit of lateral rotation of the inferior angle. You have the transverse part, retract scapula, and you have the ascending fibers, which depress scapula. Which, muscle can which muscles can protract the scapula? Uh, two, we said serratus can, serratus anterior, and pectoralis minor can protract scapula. Those muscles are basically in the front, and they reach back on the scapula, and they pull it forward. 
which muscles can laterally abduct the inferior angle. And here it is right there. Two, the descending part of traps, serratus anterior. Boom, well, that's it, all right, let's move on. Two, muscles that move the arm. And so um, the scapula is part of the pectoral groin of the shoulder. You can elevate, depress, like we said, but now I'm thinking about the shoulder, the glenohumeral joint, okay? So muscles that move the arm, moving the, the um, humerus bone, glenohumeral joint. Let me write that on the board. Muscles that move arm. We're talking about that ball and socket. Well, humeral joint. Sometimes people just call this the shoulder joint. So if someone ever says the shoulder joint, it's the glenohumeral joint, the ball and socket joint of the shoulder. And um, well, let's talk about movements at this joint. Flexion extension of the arm, starting from the anatomical position. If I bring my arms forward, flexion. If I bring them back, extension. Abduction, adduction. I've been talking about abduction all day. You can move, abduct your arms out all the way up in the frontal plane. Adduct is move them back. So once again, abduction, adduction. Medial lateral rotation. So it helps to see that rotation if you have your elbow flexed. So starting from the anatomical position, you know, if I move my arms out, if I move my arm out this way, it's rotating laterally. Sometimes they call that external rotation. If I move my arm back in, that's medial rotation or internal rotation. So I use those terms interchangeably sometimes. I usually stick with medial lateral, but I may slip in internal external rotation, different way of saying the same thing. Let's talk about the deltoid. The muscle, the deltoid muscle, named for its shape. From the lateral view, looks like an upside down triangle. Okay. Um, uh, the Greek symbol delta, so upside down. So that's what the deltoid looks like. So muscle named for its shape, deltoid. So I got three, view, three views of deltoid here because it's in the front goes all the way to the back. And uh, the three different parts can do three different actions. Deltoid muscle. So these anterior fibers go um, pretty much right there. So the anterior part of deltoid, it's originating, that's like pretty much, I'll call that lateral clavicle. That's the O for origin, lateral clavicle. So it's in the front, it's gonna insert, um, that's called the deltoid tuberosity. They all, they all insert there. So I'll write that down here. The insertion is deltoid tuberosity. Deltoid tuberosity is the insertion. Well, anyways, 
uh, insert, uh, originates from the lateral clavicle, this one can help bring your arm forward. So we call that flexion. The lateral part pretty much is originating from the acromion, that bony part of your shoulder that you can palpate. Follow my clavicle out, forms the AC joint. Yeah, I can feel it right there. That's the origin of the lateral part. It can um, mostly abduct arm, pull your arm out to the side. The lateral part originates from acromion. A B ducks on. So we usually put capital A, capital B for clarification so you don't confuse it with a deduction. They all insert on deltoid tuberosity, so I'll just leave it down there. And the posterior part, these fibers there, they're originating on um, the scapular spine. Again, inserting on deltoid tuberosity. They can help extend the arm, bring it back. Posterior part originates scapular spine. That's the origin for that. Helps to extend our Now, this muscle can also rotate the arm. I, I kind of left that out for um, just to be kind of brief about it, but what if I asked you, hmm, how can this um, rotate the arm? You would say it could immediately rotate. And if it pulls out here, how could that rotate the arm? Pulls it this way. And rotate the arm out. So this part could actually um, laterally rotate arm. This part, again, can immediately rotate. This part can laterally rotate, right? But I think the main actions are what I've listed here. Like when you work out your delts in the gym, you kind of go like this, you know, because you're flexing the arm. Or for the lateral part, like when you kind of bend forward and do the dumbbells and go like that, it feels silly demonstrating this, but <clears throat> that, um, this is how you work out your delts in the gym. Here's a picture of these O's and I's. The insertion right there. The deltoid tuberosity. Um, I, I got it down here. So let's describe the deltoid tuberosity as being on the lateral aspect, about mid shaft humerus. Okay. I use this picture again to outline the three origins: <clears throat> lateral clavicle, right there; acromion, right there and then scapular spine, posteriorly, right there. So you get a better view of it in that picture. I'm gonna move away from deltoid, let's talk about some deeper muscles called the rotator cuff muscles. <clears throat> they form a cuff around the humerus, in the glenohumeral joint. And um, well, anyways, you have to know these, what we call the SITS muscles, which is an acronym for supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, subscapularis. So the fingers represent how the muscles attach to the proximal humerus at the tubercles or tuberosities. Um, so let's go S-I-T-S. -S. So these three, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, um, they're all inserting on the greater tubercle. The lesser tubercle the muscle that attaches there is the subscapularis.
All right, so your sits muscles. Supraspinatus. Infraspinatus, I'm underlining the first letter. Teres minor. Subscapularis. First three, <clears throat> they insert, this is the insertion, they insert on greater tuberful, so the eye. Some books call it greater tubercle, some books call it greater tuberosity. Um, you may say, see either on your test, so know both. Greater tubercle, tuberosity. And it's the lesser tubercle, uh, the insertion point for subscapularis. Lesser tubercle or tuberosity. Look at some pictures of this muscle. From the posterior view, we can see the first three sits. Supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor. Okay. This next picture, we can kind of see their origins um, on the scapula here. The one, the two, the three is. One, two, three for our whiteboard notes. Okay, and here's the picture we just got through looking at. So let's talk about the origins um, for these muscles. We know what the insertions are, the greater or lesser tubercle. For number one, the supraspinatus, that space, uh, we named it as the supraspinous fossa, and that's infraspinous fossa for the other one. So the, the origin here. Supraspinous fossa. Infraspinatus originates infraspinous fossa. Teres minor, right there, I'll just describe that as lateral border of the scapula. The subscapularis, that originates in the, in the subscapular fossa. I think I got a picture of that. Here's a blank picture of the sits muscles. You can see the first three anyways. Here's subscapularis. It originates right here. Um, I'm pointing to the part that's shaded in behind the rib cage. That's the subscapular fossa. Remember, these are all the O's. These are all origins, okay? A lot of people mistakenly call this like a pec muscle. I, I could see that, but let's remember that. This muscle is filling this, it's behind the back. The pecs are on the front, okay? Where the rib cage is, this is on the back. Um, so it's kind of a deceiving picture. For example, if I just show you that, just remember that subscapularis is not a pec muscle. It, that's a common point of confusion there. Here's a lateral view of the sits muscles. So, here's the glenoid, and you can see how the muscles 
wrap around like a, um, a musculotendinous cuff. That's usually how these muscles are described. And so now that we got the attachments out of the way, let me clear the board and talk about these muscles as a group. As a group, the sits muscles, they form what's called a, a musculotendinous cuff around proximal humerus. They help um, stabilize the shoulder joint by holding the, the humerus in the glenoid. They help, oh, not have, help. They help to stabilize shoulder joint. Again, they're stabilizing that glenohumeral joint. And that's their main action. Each of these muscles can move the humerus. I won't even teach them. I'll just say their action as a group, I, I feel like this is their main action. They stabilize the shoulder joint. They help hold it in there. There are other bigger muscles that can move the shoulder joint. Um, these less so, I think, their main job, stabilizers. And let's move on. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a lateral view, a blank picture of the uh, sits muscles. Here is um, pec major, pectoralis major, and a corpobrachialis. Those are the next two. Pectoralis major, a muscle named for this region, the pectoral region in your chest. And we did the pec minor already. So here it is in a dissected cadaver with all the other muscles. Pectoralis major. There's the biceps brachii, which we'll get to. There's the deltoid. Okay. Um, you can even see descending part of traps there. And there's the uh, sternocleidomastoid. I haven't uh, done that one yet, but we'll get to it. Anyways, here's the muscle by itself. It's a, it's a big muscle, and um, it helps to visualize the attachments on this little schematic I have here. Here are the O's and the I's for pectoralis major. It originates basically on the chest. I got three things there for you. There's a part of it that originates on medial clavicle. It originates on the sternum, and it has origins on the costal cartilages there, from ribs one to six. Let's just say costal cartilage. Medial, clavicle, basically all parts of the sternum, costal, cartilage, something like ribs, one through six, costal cartilage. Let's remember that's the cartilage that helps attach the ribs to the sternum, costal cartilages. All those big fibers from top to bottom here, they converge right there. I describe this part of the humerus as the lateral lip of the intertubercular groove. So they don't insert in the groove, but just, just lateral to it on the lip of the groove. Intertubercular. 
tubercular groove right by there, lateral lip. Let's remember our bones, the intertubercular groove. Anyway, that's that's humerus bone, right? We're moving the arm. So, start here, insert there from the anatomical position. You can flex, adduct, immediately rotate the arm. So let's go through those. Starting from the anatomical position. The first one, flex, that's move your arm forward. Adduct, I have to start with my arm abducted. Adduct is bring it in, a deduction. Immediately rotate. So I have to start laterally rotated and then immediately rotate is bring it in. And again, um, every time you do this, try to feel the muscle or yourself contract. Like if I bring it in, oh yeah, I can feel my pec muscle contract over I bring it forward. Oh yeah, I, I can feel I'm using this part of the muscle. So that does help to kind of like um, be kinesthetic about it and do these things. Flex, adduct, immediately rotate arm. So those are three actions, They're all moving the shoulder joint. So I didn't have to say arm, I could say shoulder, right? Again, think about the joint that's moving. Shoulder, that's this group we're doing, muscles that can move the shoulder. Here's coracobrachialis. That muscle runs from there to there. And um, on the other slide, let me see, let me go back a few here. On this picture here, I didn't point it out, but the coracobrachialis is right there. It's a slender muscle. It's usually hidden. On this figure here, I can barely see a sliver of it right there. It's usually hidden. Here you can see it better. Coracobrachialis, named for its attachments. Let's go back to this picture. There's pec major. Here's the coracobrachialis, named for its attachments. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Let me erase this. Turns out that's the O, that's the I. Okay. It originates coracoid process of the scapula. It inserts mid shaft humerus about and the medial aspect. It's pulling from the inside, so it can adduct arm. We can also flex arm. Inserts mid shaft humerus. So therefore, it can. Well, let me demonstrate from the anatomical position. Flex arm. It can help bring the arm forward. It can adduct arm. A deduction. So I have to start abducted. It can adduct arm. Flex, adduct. That's its action. Moving on, next muscle, latissimus dorsi, the widest of the back. It's a very superficial muscle, and pretty much superficially, you got traps and lats. Okay, we did traps already. Traps and lats are the major muscles of the back. In some basic anatomy classes, these are the only two we teach. 
Um, I, I, I did rhomboids as well, but um, can't miss it. Widest at the back. That's what latissimus dorsi means, like latitude, longitude, widest of the back.